Hello, everybody. I want to talk about an amazing research topic called available data. That's right. And we've already uh, used available data and talked about it uh, throughout the semester. So let's just dive into this amazing uh, topic. So available data. This is data that you don't collect yourself. Uh, you use data sets that are collected by another researcher to conduct your own recurrent research that you're doing right at this moment. This uh, research methodology that involves using the already existing data and this existing data is summarized and collected to increase the overall effectiveness of research. And these documents can be made available by public libraries, uh, websites, uh, archives, uh, and this data is obtained from others. Um, and you know you can even find journals and newspaper entries, or I mean, this goes goes on and on and on. Uh, where this available data can come from, you really in a lot of ways. The sky's the limit. If you actually have something that's written down, um, documented somehow or another, you can use that potentially as some available data. So available data, we use it all the time. And whenever we Google something, whenever we go on Wikipedia, whenever we use the internet to search something, uh, to find information about something, there's data that's on there that's available for us to, to, to use and figure out. And uh, you know, we're really mining the available data all the time. Um, you know, I typed in higher education in Google or typed it into Wikipedia and uh, to find some information. And, and from there, you can maybe find some other pieces of information that can even take you to some other places. So uh, we use that a great deal. Uh, it, it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a really convenient to have that today, available today in, in comparison to uh, what we had in the past. So there's some other terms when I was uh, working on this uh, presentation uh, that, that are used. Available data is one of them. Secondary data is what I find most of the time. Um, and uh, the book we, we had called Available Data, but you know, it's, it's really secondary data, uh, existing data. And big data is a big buzzword that's going on today with social media, social networks. So you think of Google, Twitter, Facebook, anything that has a ton, millions and millions of users, and you can collect data on you know what, what they're searching on. They're searching on the flu or COVID-19 or, or a movie or whatever. Uh, if they're searching for something to buy, I think all of us have looked for something to buy and all of a sudden the, you get ads Hop on, on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, uh, Instagram, whatever, and um, you know, obviously, all that's con connected together. And this big data is really a big buzzword, especially for marketing as well. And you can also think of big data for like learning management systems. So you know, you can go look on there. Like, well, let's see when students actually like a like to have a class, not before nine o'clock, nine a.m. of course, and uh, you can. Um, See, all right, well, students really like classes after 11 o'clock, or students turn in their work after midnight, you know, and maybe you can figure out when is the best time to release a, a test or when, when a test can be open or closed and whatnot like that. And there's other statistics that you can get from uh, the, the, lang the learning management systems that are out there. And there's a lot of other things as well. Um, I think those that are able to figure out how to use this big data are, are going to have, have the keys to a lot of things for research and marketing and understanding uh, of a lot of really big things going out there. And there's a lot of big buzz for that, that big data. I think Google is one of the big ones, and I'm, I'll talk about that. Uh, so Emil Durkheim, I'm, my French isn't very good, but uh, uh, basically he uh, wrote this book, La Suicide, in 1897, and uh, wanted to come up with this theoretical uh, uh, typology of suicide to explain the different effects of of social factors and how they might lead to a suicide. And this is one of the first times that available data was used uh, for research. So he, he used hospital and death records to find patterns of those that, that uh, completed suicide. So those that attempted suicide and survived, you can inter you could interview them, but those that, that uh, committed suicide, of course, they, they, you couldn't interview. And so the hospital would take records like, you know, you know height and you know, male or female, or, you know, what the jobs were, and, you know, religion, those type of things. So you have these statistics, you know, what time of the year uh, they committed suicide, or, or you know, what, what religion and work and those type of things. So he's able to come up with some theories, four theories of why uh, this happened, and this using of available data. And um, in a lot of ways, I think this really show shows some of the, the possibilities with this with this data that it doesn't have to be through observation alone, you know. And uh, he's also known as uh, one of the ones that, you know, uh, 
is an architect of this modern social science. Those theories were founded as these concepts of social facts defined as norms, values, and, and structures for, of society. And, um, and, it, and it, but by putting those multiple things together, that multivariate statistical analysis, is, you know, you put religion and gender and age and time of the year and all those things together, you can uh, get together with some uh, you know, correlations and whatnot. Um, let's talk about some of the pros of available data. One, it saves time. It's already collected for you. There it is. That's going to save you a lot of time right there. It's cost effective. Uh, it's it's it may be free. Uh, hopefully, it is free. Uh, a lot of the stuff from the government is free. And even if you wanted to take us have a survey of hundred thousand you know musicians or whatever, um, and someone already collected that data, it's going to cost you more than a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars or two hundred fifty dollars. And that's the cost of the data set. It's going to definitely be worth it in comparison for you to, you know, send out a hundred thousand questionnaires. You know, I just can imagine just the, you know, the price of the stamps alone, and that kind of the manpower to put everything together and everything like that. So um, the data can be can come from really high quality sources. You know, you think of the census, you think of the, the things from government. A lot of the big companies uh, conduct research, and and, and uh, you can have access to their secondary data. Um, the available data out there, uh, known to be relatively available in, in comparison to primary data because it's already collected. You know, the primary data you're, you're going to have to collect yourself, and that could take a, a lot of time, and depending on a lot of money potentially as well. And one thing nice about it, if you can find the available data for what you're trying to do research, you can start doing research immediately with that data. Um, requires very little uh, research. Uh, and time from the research for the researcher and saves the researcher's time as well uh, because the source is already already done and it gives you some opportunities for various analysis the correlational longitudinal subgroup analysis as well some of the cons of available data is that uh, can you find the data that you actually need i don't know um it, it may exist it may not exist you don't really have control over the, the data is, is is this a quality source uh of, of, of data um, is the data out? Is the data outdated? <laughs> you know, like census is every ten years, but there might be sometimes they have studies that happen every fifteen years or every twenty years. Uh, will that work? Like I'm really into technology. A lot of times, you know, <laughs> really three years is, is ancient history in computer land. You know, uh, so if I get some information from twenty years ago, I guess it's archaeological. You know, it's historic. It's more historical at that point. You know. So it just, it just depends on, on what, what, you're, what you're looking at and, and what, you, what you can get as well. And obviously some of the bigger surveys, you might have to use older data because, because you just can't financially or time constraints wise to send out 100,000 surveys. Uh, no control over the methodology. Uh, it's already done. You know, hopefully it was a good study, but you need to figure that out before you use that data set, of course. And the data can be really complicated leading to more advanced statistical knowledge. So you need to either find someone that has a lot of statistical knowledge, or maybe you have to take more statistical classes, you know, they start taking more stat classes to get better uh, to be able to look at this data and whatnot. So uh, those are some of the cons. So let's talk about the process of using available data, and that's basically the process of just anytime you're trying to do any kind of research. One is identify your research topic and come up with your, with your question or questions. Uh, select a data set that's available for you. Get to Get to know the data. Get to learn this data. I'm going to talk about that more on the next slide. Um, it's very important to have that. Find the right statistical methods. Uh, then eventually use software like SPS as that will work with your data. Run your data in your for your survey, and then hopefully you're going to present your your research either in a paper or presentation or some other. Maybe make a video uh, as well. So let's talk about getting to know your available data. Uh, what was the original purpose of this data? Uh, who sponsored this data? And, and, and who collected it as well? Um, know the, the design studies and the methods. Um, what's the structure of the data? You know, uh, who, who were the participants? Uh, how were they selected? You know, uh, were observations used in this? You know, or, you know, how, how, anyways, a lot of things in there you need to ask questions about. Know what instruments were used to collect the data? You know, was it a questionnaire, a survey, uh, interviews, emails? You know, uh, it's good to know that. And if it, it was like a questionnaire, 
get that questionnaire and look at it. Get the code book and look at it and to be able to figure out stuff. Uh, on the research that I was doing this semester, there was a couple of things that I just didn't know what they were and, and trying to find the code book and figure out what they were, were talking about and couldn't quite figure that out. So this, this we decided not to use that uh, point there. Or there's something else, well, we need to combine this together for this to work for that. And um, so we, so anyways, get, if, you know the, if you have the code book, you can figure things out. So you may want to, uh, you know, run some data on it, you know, run, run the means and correlations and frequencies in it, and do the numbers actually make sense? You know, are there any issues that are that are there that you're questioning? And do this, and then, uh, you know, always, you know, be aware of, of, of intuitively, does this soft, does this um, data make sense? These numbers work. Uh, you know, if you're trying to do, you know, whatever the Whatever it is, if you're if you're doing research into you know higher education, and it turns out that 200 percent of the people all went to college, well then something's wrong with that data, right? So you just need to figure that out uh, because you shouldn't go over 100 uh, percent. You may even want to use some dummy variables, and we talked about that this semester as well, and just prep your data and see if that actually uh, can work, uh, is working. So uh, there's a lot of sources for available data. I just picked three um, just because they're kind of big. And interesting is aggregate data from uh, University of Michigan, uh, the ICPSR, and it's amazing what you can find there. I thought the, the social network data was interesting. There's something called trends at trends.google.com uh, slash backslash trends, and uh, they use this a lot for the for the flu trends that were going on, um, like in uh, 2009 and things like that. And of course, the National Archives. So if you have any interest in uh, you know, politicians like the presidents, the presidential libraries, uh, so much information. The last time I was at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. was 2011, and just the amount of information that was there, it was just, uh, just was wonderful, actually. It was amazing to walk in there. And uh, just have your eyes just get tired. So I, I want to show you a couple of these up close, and uh, especially this uh, IC, uh, ICPSR uh, website here. And I'll just type in higher education just to kind of show. And I clicked on one. And you see the study from 1970 to 2011. And you see there's also some possibilities that even, uh, you know, you can read about it and, and uh, see who how many people have downloaded it as well. And if you look at the downloads, look at that, SPSS. So you can just download that file and then start to use it for your research. You know, and I have to remember typing all that stuff in. No, you have to worry about this. Already, already, already for you. Thank goodness for available data, uh, and so that's that's a could save save you a lot of time with that as well. And also with this particular one here, that was actually here's part of the the survey ask, and you can kind of scroll through the whole document. And also there's the code book also that you can download as well. So uh, that would be very useful for any researcher. I just type into Google Trends uh, COVID nineteen. So like you know, if you're searching for symptoms, you're searching for questions about COVID nineteen. You know, if you're looking throughout the whole country or the whole world, you can see where spikes potentially are. You know, do you, and some of the, the effects, you know, loss of smell, right? That was one of them. So you see that. Why did I lose my sense of smell? You know, that could be things to put together in, in, a, in a database. So I just kind of did a news uh, search here, but you can search for images and a bunch of other things the past seven days or by year, by, you know, whatever, your, your time period and, and whatnot. So that just popped up like that. It took some, some interesting possibilities with the Google Trends for research. Or, and National Archives, and like I mentioned before, there's just there's so much information that's there that you can find uh, at the National Archives. So, and happily, a lot of this is available online now. Um, or you can take a trip to Washington, D.C. if you needed to as well. So let's talk about accessing available data. So first off, you need to select a database. And, you know, first off, you need to kind of ask you know, or find what databases are available to you, which data sets uh, have the variables that you might need for research, you know? Is, is, is that even, can you even find that? Um, is the kind of data you need even available? So those are all good questions to ask yourself about data sets out there. Who owns the data set? You know, figure that out. Uh, can you even get the data set? You know, does, is it free? Does it cost something? Uh, what kind of permission would you need? Um, a lot of times, uh, there's rules about, you know, storing the data set. So they say, well, you can't store it here, or you have to make sure this is protected by this, 
or you can't use this information to find out information from a, one particular person in there as well. And in, of course, it, you know, it's always good to know if you need to have an institutional review board, IRB approval, to be able to use the secondary data. A lot of times, not as much, it's less because you're not actually collecting the data yourself, um, but you have to use it in a specific way. And even for what we're doing this semester, there was specific uh, guidelines where we had to do how, how we could use the data and not, and not be able to use it another way to have it identifiable. So one of the big things I found when doing research for secondary uh, secondary data, um, available data, is something called data dredging. And uh, you may not have heard of it uh, before, or we talked about it maybe in the summer a little bit. And the, and the mindset is like, okay, I found this cool data set. I need to publish something. So I'm going to throw everything into SBSs and find some type of uh, correlations in there. Okay, so like let's do an example of kids eating lunch in, in, in school. So, you know, so kids walk into school. Is there a difference between walking to school, getting dropped off by the parents, getting dropped off by the bus? Uh, kids bringing their lunch to school. Uh, kids buying their lunch in advance. Uh, you know, kids that are certain heights. You can just, if you have all this type of data and you put it in there, oh, yeah, turns out if you're five foot two and you're more likely to eat lunch at school than if you're five foot four, you know, and you're kind of thinking, really? No. Now, that's the, that's the wrong way to figure out data is to put something there. It's, oh, I found a correlation. So now, now I'm a researcher. No, no, no. You need the scientific method. You need to have a hop, hop, hypothesis, right? You need to have a research question that you're going to have with this data and uh, go in there. So this data dredging is called sometimes data phishing and uh, a data mining practice in which large volumes of data are analyzed, seeking a possible relationship between the data. And, uh, you know, the traditional method, of course, in contrast, you're going to have a hypothesis to ex uh, and follows with examination of the data. So make sure you know the difference between uh, using existing data to answer a question or one, you're just trying to find some type of correlation uh, so you can publish something. Um, and, uh, and, you know, secondary data, you, you can't really pr prove causation. And we talked about that this semester. Really, the, the base, the best case scenario is that you have some type of strong correlation. Uh, but, and of course, you know, I, that little example I talked about eating lunch and uh, height and whatever else, you know, multi coronary, you know, it could lead to false results. That doesn't necessarily mean there's anything that's really there on that particular thing. So, can you use your available data for your dissertation? Absolutely, or, or for your thesis? Absolutely, you can. Uh, it may be cost and time effective. To conduct your research this way, you can have this access to large populations, you know, such as the census, you know, 350 million people. Uh, I don't think any of us could like, collect that much data, right? Uh, it would be impossible to do that yourself. Even like 100,000, even 10,000 would be very difficult to do. 1,000, anyways, uh, it'd be difficult to do that. You can start off with available data, then move to primary data to focus your research. So you may start off with this, and oh, now I need to kind of narrow it down a little bit. I'll do a little bit of my own. Uh, original research and collect data that way. You can do a combination of both available data and primary data. Uh, this available data can lead you to ask questions that you may have not thought about before and uh, could hopefully maybe even lead to the focus of what data you really need to conduct your research. So yeah. So in conclusion, available data can be very useful for researchers, of course. We've already used it this semester. It can save time and money, can give you access to data that would be impossible to conduct yourself. Make sure you have a hypothesis and answer and a question that you want to answer when you do this research for the secondary data. Um, and research uh, data sets uh, can, can help you answer some research questions, of course, and get access to the data sets and then use the software to analyze it and share your findings and complete your research and share it with the world. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you all listening to this uh, presentation on available data. Thank you all. Thank you.